the most common exploit in DeFi has got to be Oracle manipulation attacks. And this is even backed up by the literature. A recent study titled Decentralized Finance Attacks that was conducted by six different institutions, including UC Berkeley, ETH Zurich, and the Imperial College of London, concluded that indeed price oracle manipulations were actually the number one most common DeFi exploit of exploits that have occurred in the past. And so today, of course, we have to deep dive and understand all of the different ways in which these different oracle manipulations can come about. What is the, the most canonical example? How, how does this happen canonically? And then can we understand what are some more advanced types of price manipulation? All right, but of course, before we dive in, my name is Owen and Almost two years ago now, I founded Guardian Audits, and ever since then, we've uncovered dozens and dozens and dozens of critical and high vulnerabilities across completing dozens and dozens of smart contract audits with myself personally spending probably at this point over 2000 hours auditing. And my goal with all of these videos, and especially this one, is to distill down everything that I've learned from spending these thousands of hours auditing and give it to you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better smart contract auditor or blockchain developer in a fraction of the time. So with that out of the way, let's dive in to these Oracle manipulation attacks. All right, so we've got the whiteboard pulled up here and we're gonna start off by going through what is the very crux of an Oracle manipulation attack? And we're gonna understand exactly how that can come about. And then we're gonna see some more complex examples of Oracle manipulation as it's not always just this super basic example. It can actually get very interesting when we start to get some you know, complex integrations going on with DeFi protocols. And then we're gonna understand how you know, people like Uniswap have tried to address this issue of Oracle manipulation. And then we're going to understand how, you know, maybe it's not so much of a good idea. Maybe it's not a foolproof fix. And then maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a, a short ad for Chainlink at the end. <laughs> and of course, if you want to go a step further and actually apply the knowledge that we're talking about today, and you want to work with me personally to take you from where you are now to become a senior level auditor then you can get my proven formula to become a senior auditor in six months below in the description all right with that out of the way let's talk about what is the the basis at the most basic level what is oracle manipulation right so let's talk about just a a simple DeFi protocol that needs to get the price of an asset Right, so let's say we have our smart contract here. This is our smart contract. It's a nice little rectangle and it needs to get the price of, let's say, wrapped ether. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call another contract, right? We're gonna call an Oracle contract. Basically just a contract that is going to give us the price of an asset, in this case, wrapped ether. So we're going to call a function in from our system to the Oracle contract. We're going to call get price or something to that extent, right? So we're going to get price from the Oracle. And if this is, for example, just a chain link Oracle, then prices have been aggregated here to this contract from off chain. And when we get the price, we're just going to get the latest aggregate price. However, if this is, for example, like a, uh, a Uniswap pool, and in that case, when if we wanted to get the price, we would be calling slot zero, and we can look more into this in a few minutes, we're going to be calling slot zero and reading what is the current square root price, what is the current price that is stored in Uniswap right now. Okay, great. And then we're going to get that response back and we're going to be able to actually use that price in our DeFi protocol and decide like, okay, this is what somebody's collateral is worth. So based on that, we're willing to lend you out X number of stable coins or something like this. So that's all great, 
the only issue that comes in when we're using an oracle that is computing price on chain is that it is susceptible to be manipulated during the transaction that you are interacting with this protocol in. So what does that look like? That might look like if I was going to, let's say, open a position where I have to deposit some collateral. So let's say I'm going to like borrow some funds. Let's say this is a lending borrowing contract and I'm going to put down some collateral. Now, based on what this collateral is, I'm going to get some amount, some size of a loan, right? So I'm going to get some borrowed amount based on how much collateral I put down. There's a certain range of valid borrowed amounts that I can take out. For example, if we say I want to have a 150% collateralization ratio, this means that if I put down $150 of wrapped ETH, then what I'm going to get as a borrowed amount, the maximum I can borrow at a and have a 150% collateralization ratio is 100, let's say, die, right? So I'm putting down $150 and I'm borrowing $100 worth of die. And how do we determine how much value of ETH you deposited? as your collateral well we need to get the price right so we need to know the price of eth so where do we get the price from we get it from our oracle contract right we get it from wherever we're calling to get the price now the only issue with this is if somebody else is able to interact with the oracle contract and say do some sort of a, a swap on Uniswap to change what the reported s price is in slot zero before we read it, then they're going to be able to manipulate what the price is and, and what the value is of this collateral before they interact with this system. So what somebody can do is they can, they can swap on Uniswap, which is our, our Oracle, that's where we're reading from. And then we can come and based on some inflated price, so let's say that originally ETH was at $1,000 per ETH, and then I do my swap. And then now let's say, let's say it was a, a huge swap and we can even, we can talk about flash loans in a second. And now the price of ETH goes to $2,000 dollars per ETH. Now, while the price is $2,000 per ETH in this Oracle contract, then I can come over here and I can now, after executing that swap, do a big borrow. So now instead of this, my wrapped ETH being worth $150, so the, the amount of wrapped ETH here was 0.15. So instead of this 0.15 wrapped ETH being worth $150, actually what we what we end up with is 1.15 times $2,000. So actually my wrapped ETH is worth $300 if we're just reading this Oracle, which has been manipulated. So here, instead of taking out 100 die based on this, I'm able to take out 200 die. So what I've done here is I've taken 200 die, but I've only provided 0.15 wrapped ETH as collateral. And as we know, the actual market price of ETH, this is what, you know, Ether is worth in the real world on, you know, centralized exchanges, on other DEXs. And, 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 you know, if we, if you're going to barter ETH with your friend, the going rate for ETH is a thousand dollars. But since the Oracle is our whole world for pricing Ether from the context of this contract, we think that the real world price of ETH is $2,000. So in fact, what we've done as, as a protocol is we've allowed a position to be opened with $150 real value of collateral. And we gave $200 of die. 
So as an attacker, what I want to do is I would just walk away with this money, right? I would just walk away with the, the $50 Delta. So I have no incentive to pay back my, my loan as it's immediately unhealthy. And so what an attacker would do afterwards is, is they would take this, this $50 profit, they would go ahead and, you know, pay back, they would swap the other direction to send the price back to $1,000 per ETH. So they would swap it back to be able to capture that, that rise in price. And then, so the pool price would go back after, at the end of the transaction, and the attacker would be able to walk away with their, their 200 die. And then the protocol realizes that actually the collateralization ratio is less than 100%. In fact, it is 150 divided by 200, which is three quarters, which is 75%. So this is an unhealthy position immediately and it needs to be liquidated, but it's insolvent at this point. All right, so let's have a quick look at what a system that could get exploited this way actually looks like. So we'll see it in practice. So here we've got a very, very simple lending contract where we're accepting ether as collateral and then we are lending out DAI. So we've got a collateralization ratio of 120% required. So basically what we're doing is we're specifying, we're saying that, hey, all positions on this, on this lending protocol, they need to be over collateralized by 120%. Meaning if I put down $1.2 of wrapped ETH or of ether, then I can borrow $1 of DAI. And if I ever go below that ratio of collateral to borrowed amount in my position, then you'll get liquidated, your position will be closed. And that sort of that barrier from 100%, which is, you know, you are exactly solvent. But if you go any lower, you'll be insolvent and you won't be able to pay back and cover your borrowed amount. That delta from 100% to 120%, that's kind of like the buffer for the protocol to be able to still close your position in a healthy state where we're able to cover your borrowed amount and then still have you know some some breathing room so that the liquidations can you know they can they can still happen within you know a certain range of blocks and you're not going to go immediately and solve it so that's just what we specified as like a, a protocol configuration and we can see we here we've got a borrow function. We've got a way to check if a position is healthy. And of course, as a part of that, we need to get the collateral price. So let's see what happens. Let's just read through the borrowing function here. So we're going to load in the position into memory. The position is able to, you're able to borrow an additional amount. That amount is going to be sent to you at the end of the transaction and then your collateral is increased by the message dot value. So whatever amount that you are sending to this contract with, to this payable function. So before we end the transaction, we need to check if the position is healthy after making these modifications, right? So we wanna make sure that we are over this 120% collateralization ratio. Otherwise, we're going to go insolvent and the protocol is gonna end up with bad debt. They're not gonna be able to pay back the, the borrowed amount. So if we look at this is position healthy function, we've got the collateral price here, and we'll look, how, we'll look into how we're getting that in a second. And what we're doing is we're computing the health factor, basically. So we're doing the collateral divided by the borrow amount. And then, you know, we have to deal with some decimal stuff, but we're gonna ignore decimals for now. So with this right here, we're just replicating exactly what we did here to compute the health factor is the amount of collateral divided by the amount of borrowed amount. So the, the value of collateral divided by the value of the borrowed amount is exactly what we're doing here. We're making an assumption here that the borrow amount, which is in DAI, 
is equal to one dollars that's a bad thing we're just doing it here for simplicity but the interesting thing here is we're getting the collateral price so this is where we need to use an oracle and the oracle that we're choosing to use which is a poor choice is this uniswap v3 pool now what we're doing is we're reading directly from slot zero and if you don't know what slot zero is then go ahead and watch my uniswap v3 made easy video where we go and we we go through the whole uniswap v3 protocol and understand you know exactly what is slot zero and how you can derive the price from slot zero now we're not going to dive into you know exactly why we have to do these things to calculate the the actual price here that's going to be used but the important thing here is that we're reading from slot zero now slot zero just holds what is the current price in the uniswap pool so if we draw out a x times y equals k curve here and let's say that you know slot zero says that the price is right here that's where the current price is then that's what we're going to read and we're going to basically convert that into whatever price we need to use within our system so of course like we said the issue with this is that somebody can come and swap they can swap on uniswap and manipulate this returned square root price x96 value from slot zero so if that is saying that price is here and we're saying that originally this is like a thousand dollars or something like this then if somebody swaps up which i think in this case token zero is die and token one is wrapped eth so in fact uh, increasing the price of wrapped eth will be swapping this way because we're going to have less wrapped ether as you swap here the y value is getting smaller so the price of wrapped eth actually increases as we swap this way just to be clear this token one is wrapped ether and then token zero is die and then they would basically inflate the price make it look like it's at two thousand dollars like we did here and then right when the price has been moved to two thousand dollars that's when they call the borrow function and they borrow when their their message dot value let's say they you know they send some number of eth when that eth is going to get valued at two thousand dollars so our is position healthy check is going to value their their collateral at the current collateral price which is our inflated two thousand dollars amount and then we're going to say oh well they're only borrowing 200 die or something like this and so their their health factor is fine but really if we were to value this at the accurate one thousand dollar price then this position would totally not be fine it would be below the required 120 percent health factor and in fact it can be insolvent and so we can even look at this example to actually work through the numbers here we've got initially let's say market price in the real world eth is worth five thousand dollars let's get a little bullish here that's the real price of eth and in our uniswap pool we'll just make things really simple and ignore concentrated liquidity and everything like this with our let's assume it's you know distributed on the full x times y equals k curve what we have is we'll just have 10 eth and 50,000 die that would give us a k constant of 500,000 and we could do a normal swap or we could do a flash loan where we actually don't even have to have the amount of die up front to cause this to happen and we basically would swap so that i take five ether out of the pool and then i would have to put 50,000 die into the pool to make that swap or if i wanted to do a flash loan then i could just flash loan this out and then pay the the flash loan back at the end of the transaction but what we've done here is we have increased the price of ether to twenty thousand dollars so let's say we we moved that square root price x96 variable to a, a tick or a a price that is twenty thousand dollars and now we start interacting with our lending protocol let's say i put in five eth as collateral that's going to look like it's worth a hundred thousand dollars if you're just reading this value of twenty thousand as the price then i can take a loan 
at a 150% collateralization ratio. So it seems perfectly healthy given that I have $100,000 of value in collateral. So that is going to allow me to take out about $67,000 worth of DAI and be totally healthy with a 150% collateralization ratio. Now, in actuality, this position is under collateralized. My collateral is only worth $25,000 at the current market price of ETH, but the system is reading the manipulated price. So what we do is we wanna take this, the $66,666, and we use it to buy up ETH elsewhere, where ETH is the real current price of ETH, which is $5,000. We end up with about you know 13 and a third ETH, and then I can use five of these ETH to just swap the pool back to the original price. So, you know, sell that five ETH at the, the current price of ETH and then send it back to this original state. And then I'll have uh, 8.33 ETH left over and I'll have the, the 50,000 die that came out of this swap back. And then I can repay the flash loan if I took a flash loan and then just walk away with those 8.33 ETH that was left over, which is at the current market price about a $40,000 profit. So of course we're ignoring fees and a lot of things like that, but this is very clearly how you can manipulate a system that is attempting to read from something like slot zero on a Uniswap pool. So really alarm bells should be going off in your head anytime you see a protocol trying to read from, of course, slot zero, or when they're really just trying to derive any price from something that is on chain. And so it doesn't always look exactly like this. This is, of course, the canonical example but there can be many different ways that this actually comes about. And so for example, the cream finance exploit, which relied on YUSD as a critical piece of this exploit was an example of one such manipulation. And it didn't look like what we've gone through here. It's not because they're reading from a Uniswap pool. It has to do with the way that their oracles valued YUSD. Okay, so the price of YUSD was derived by the balance of YCRV in the yearn contract divided by the total supply, total supply of YUSD, right? So just a, a canonical way to derive what is the value of a single share of this thing that holds basically a fractional share of all the YCRV that's deposited into the system. So essentially what the attacker did is they inflated, artificially inflated this price of YUSD by just inflating the balance of YCRV in this yearn contract. And so this was just actually just a small piece of the exploit as a whole is actually a rather complex exploit, but this was a key part of actually pulling this exploit off, was being able to inflate the price of YUSD because this value was derived from something that was on chain and it could be manipulated in that singular transaction. So the attacker made the price of YUSD go up and of course, Cream Finance accepted YUSD as collateral so they could make this collateral look a whole lot more valuable than it actually is. And essentially they were able to open an insolvent position, a position that didn't have enough collateral. It literally had less collateral than it had borrowed amount. And then, so they just walked away with the, the extra borrowed amount. And that extra borrowed amount was to the tune of something like half a billion dollars. And so they're able to just basically drain the entire protocol of, I think something like $120 million. So moral of the story is you see something, some price that gets derived from values that are entirely on chain. You need to dig deeper and see if there's some sort of manipulation attack that could be possible there. And likely there often is. Now, of course, Uniswap has come up with a 
partial solution for this problem to be able to actually have on-chain oracles. So what you can do is you can add time to the equation. So as we saw with our lending example, and then of course with this cream finance exploit, the issue was time, right? So in a single block, I was able to manipulate the price that this Oracle was giving. I was able to manipulate the, the price of YUSD within a single transaction. So what Uniswap does is they say, okay, well, instead of just allowing the price to be manipulated on a single block in a single transaction, we are going to expose what is called a TWAP, a time weighted average price. So the TWAP here is basically saying, okay, we're not going to just use the current price. We're going to use, let's say we're going to use this, which is like, which is the price from last block. We're going to use the price from four blocks ago. We're going to use the price of, you know, eight blocks ago. And we're going to, we're going to basically aggregate all of these things. And we're going to give an average price over the last 30 minutes or something like this. So over the last 30 minutes, ether was worth 1547 or something like this. And so if I wanted to manipulate this TWAP, I can't just flash loan and manipulate the, the pool in this transaction because that actually won't even affect the TWAP because this current price, whatever the current value of slot zero is right now, is not even factored into the TWAP. It's not even become an observation that's included, which is, you know, one of these little ticks here. And this does effectively negate any kind of flash loan or manipulation like this that happens in a singular transaction. So in that sense, this is a good solution. However, there are some other considerations for manipulation, of course. These are just a lot more capital intensive since you do actually have to veritably change the price on the Uniswap pool for a period of blocks. So that price does actually have to be literally changed in the state of the blockchain for a number of blocks to be able to actually affect the price that this, this TWAP is giving you. Okay, so how would you actually still manipulate the, the TWAP here? What we would do is you want to manipulate the price for as many blocks as you can possibly do so, right? So if I want to increase the price of Ether, if I could control the next 30 blocks and I could say that, okay, from block, let's say this is block 100 to block 130 over here, I am going to, on block 100, swap the pool up to a price of, let's say, like, you would want to, and you'd have to make it something significant, something like $5,000 which would require a good deal of capital to do so, swap it up to $5,000 and you can't do a flash loan or anything like this because you actually have to pay the flash loan back and let this transaction get recorded. Then for these 30 blocks, I wanna make sure that nobody arbitrages me, right? Because I've just made a terrible swap, right? I've moved the price of Ether up to $5,000 when in fact the real current price of Ether is about $1,500. So every single arbitrageur and their, their mother, their cousin, their dog, they want to come and sell ether for $5,000 in this pool. But what you have to do, this is the really, really hard part, is to you know figure out a way to have the pool literally inaccessible for 30 blocks. So nobody can do this and come and steal your lunch before you 30 blocks later come and you swap the pool back to 1547. And so by way of doing this, you have now added an observation that is 30 blocks long to the TWAP. And in reality, it would have to be something even, even higher than this to really cause a really noticeable inflation. But now these 30 blocks are going to be factored into the the 30 minute window that this TWAP is using. And now the TWAP, instead of saying 1547, it might say 
1736 or something like this, right? And so we have effectively manipulated this TWAP to be artificially increased by some amount. And now I've got a system. So now I could do the same thing where I go to a borrow lending protocol, deposit wrapped ether, it gets valued at $1,700 when in fact it's only actually worth $1,500. And then at that point, it may be possible to exploit the borrow lending protocol and walk away with some additional more money that you borrowed than you actually put down. So in a proof of work network, it is extremely unlikely that you would be able to get enough hashing power to be able to control the network for these 30 blocks here. That's extremely, extremely unlikely and cost, cost prohibitive. However, ETH has recently switched to, of course, proof of stake with ETH 2.0. And that actually makes this kind of manipulation a little bit more interesting and perhaps a little bit more capital efficient, if you would say. So it could actually be something that might be able to be pulled off depending on the pool, depending on you know what resources you have at your disposal and uniswap has actually done some some research on exactly what it would take to manipulate a uniswap pool by a certain percentage so here they're talking about a two block 20 percent manipulation if i could add to the twop basically one time and just have two blocks next to each other so if i wanted to go from this block to this block let's say this is block 135 and then followed by block 136. If in block 135 I swap the price up and then I make sure that nobody in in the rest of that block is swapping a new swap and then I want to be the the very first in the next block to swap it down. I want to cause an update of an observation to get that inflated price written there. And so this can be done if you were a block proposer and you knew that you were going to have two blocks in a row that you would get to propose. So we've got a table here to look at these two block 20% manipulations. So if I wanted to manipulate the 30 minute TWAP up by 20%, here's how much capital it would require. So I can swap either, I think this is 700 billion, so almost a trillion dollars to swap token zero on on usdc wrapped eth so i think that is that's usdc so if you had a almost a, a trillion dollars of usdc then you could perform a two block oracle manipulation and you could manipulate the twop up by 20 percent so unfortunately there's not many exploits on chain in fact there are none that will yield you two billion or or a trillion dollars of actual capital. So that is obviously not really realistic. We can see the, the cheapest manipulation here is on the scale of 27 billion, which is on the, the uni wrapped ETH pool. But of course, what if we could control more blocks, right? What if we could, instead of just having this one, one block or two blocks in a row, what if we could do three blocks in a row? They actually pull some data here and they say that on average, we can expect a, a block proposal with around 1% share to be assigned to propose three blocks in a row about 0.2 times per month. So once every five months, a block proposer with a share of 1% will be able to propose three blocks in a row one time every five months. And so if I control those five blocks here, or those three blocks here, then the cost actually goes significantly down. So from the manipulation length of two blocks to three blocks, the cost goes from almost a trillion dollars to just under a billion dollars, and in some cases, uh, even 300 million. And this is even the USDC wrapped ETH pool. So if we looked at uh, a pool like the, the uni wrapped ETH pool, or even, you know, even lower liquidity pools, then this might be even more susceptible to this kind of manipulation. And then of course, if you were able to control four blocks, five blocks, six blocks, seven blocks, it becomes even more potentially possible to pull off a profitable manipulation like this. Though still 
probably unlikely. All right, so what is the takeaway after looking at all these different kinds of price oracle manipulation attacks? Well, honestly, the takeaway might be to just go ahead and use Chainlink every single time, right? This is not an issue that you have to worry about with Chainlink. Of course, you are sort of, you know, you're putting trust in the consensus mechanism for the, the, the price of the Chainlink feeds. But if you're going to trust that the large entities like, you know, Coinbase and Lido and, and these people who are have large stakes as block proposers. Basically, if you're using a TWAP, you're essentially, at least in some portion, putting trust in those entities to not manipulate the TWAP price because they control, you know, X number of blocks in a row on the network. So honestly, in my opinion, Chainlink is just a better solution, at least in this point in time. We'll see what kind of solutions come out in the near future for these on-chain oracles. But between it being the most common exploit and just, you know, the number of exploits that we've seen and, and what we looked at today, Chainlink is probably still the best way to go for your oracle needs. All right, so fantastic. I hope that after watching this video, you understand you know, what does oracle manipulation look like what are the different kinds of Oracle manipulation? I hope you understand that it's not just the canonical example of reading from slot zero. It can be expanded to just manipulating the price of anything that is derived on chain. And I hope you have some interesting exploit ideas. And of course, whenever you see something that is using a price that is derived from on chain values, then alarms should go off. And of course, if you do want to go a step further, you wanna work with me personally to take your auditing game from where you are now to being a senior level auditor, then of course you can go in the description below. You can get my proven formula to become a senior auditor in six months. But even so, I'm going to continue to put out everything that I know, all of these interesting exploit attack vectors on YouTube for free. We're gonna go as in-depth as possible. So stay tuned for the next one and I look forward to seeing you next time.